Do you want to know the secret behind pairing the perfect flavors together? I mean, not all flavor combinations are a good match. I mean, we can't all be like garlic and onions or chocolate and coffee, which are absolutely delectable. So let me share with you this little flavor science hack to really elevate your cooking game and tell you exactly which ingredients should be combined to make the most mouthwatering dishes. We definitely have to start with the food pairing hypothesis because this is the most widely accepted theory looking at why do we match certain flavors over and over again and it's thought to transcend things like individual preference or individual recipes. Now this theory is the brainchild of a Michelin starred chef Heston Blumenthal and luckily this theory is very straightforward, which I love. I never take that for granted in science. I love a straightforward hypothesis. This theory just says that the more aromatic compounds two ingredients or two foods share, the better match they will be. So a good match has a lot of flavor overlap, while a bad match has very little to no flavor overlap. Before we move on, just a quick note on flavor, because I've noticed that people tend to think flavor and taste is the same thing, but they're not synonyms. Taste is just one component of flavor, because flavor actually means not only the taste of food, but also the aroma or the odor, as well as if it triggers our trigeminal senses in our mouth and nasal cavity. And I think flavor science is super, super interesting, and I have a whole video on this, I'll put the link in the description. But why I bring this up is that how much we like a food, what scientists have seen now is taste is actually not as important as the aroma is. So about 80% of why we like a food is due to its aroma. We'll say like 20%. This is really comes down to the basic taste. So whether we like the sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or umami, you know, taste of the food. So what Blumenthal is saying is that it's really these specific molecules that start in the food, migrate into the air, and then move into our nose, this aroma of the food. This is what determines if foods are a good pair. And the more of the aroma compounds that overlap between the two foods, the better the pair, right? That's the foundation of the food pairing hypothesis. I think a real example would help illustrate this point. And like I said, there's a ton of research into this, so it's not hard to find an example. But let's check out this study from a group of scientists that was looking at whether shrimp scampi and seasoned mussels would pair well together. Now that I think about this, I don't know why I picked this study because I don't like shrimp or mussels and seafood in general kind of like creeps me out. I, I can't eat it. Anyways, the first step is to list out all the ingredients in each recipe. That's the left-handed column here. And then you need to identify all the flavor compounds, or at least the main flavor compounds in each of these recipes. And these compounds are listed on the right-handed column. Now flavor, although maybe you don't think about it like this, flavor just comes from these specific chemicals or these specific molecules in the food. So what we need to do is link with a line each flavor compound back to the ingredients that contain it. So this helps us visualize how much flavor overlap really is there because we have the lines connecting each ingredient to the flavors. And remember, the more overlap, the better a pair. Most often, this type of data, it's gonna be shown as a flavor network or what you see here. So this is sort of like a big map of flavors. So each node, that is one specific ingredient and two ingredients will be connected by a line if they share a flavor compound. Now the line becomes thicker if the ingredients share several flavor compounds. So the thicker the line, the bigger flavor overlap. Now the size of the circle, this is related to how prevalent an ingredient is in certain cultures. How often is it in different recipes? So as you can see here, garlic is used a lot in this type of culture. That's why its circle is so big. Personally, I think this makes it a lot easier to visualize what foods have more of a flavor overlap, right? You just have to look at like the thickness of that line to connect, you know, certain ingredients that might be a good match. 
But as you can imagine, these sort of flavor networks or matrices get pretty complicated the more you put on it. So check out this map where it's looking at different categories of food and it includes everything from like fruits, grains, spices, dairy, and this, this is a bit, a bit too much to handle, I think. This food pairing hypothesis has been used extensively by chefs, by restauranteurs, trying to find new and different food combinations that we haven't quite discovered yet. Blumenthal himself, using this hypothesis, actually found out that you could quite easily pair something like white chocolate and caviar, and this could act as a salt replacer. But this is really just the beginning because other chefs start looking at these flavor networks, study these networks, and come up with their own, sometimes very unique combinations. We saw things like licorice and salmon, uh, passion fruit and oysters, even like banana and parsley's. And all these combinations were thought of because of that overlap in aroma molecules. I know some of these flavor combinations are pretty out there, so I want to show you a tool where you can sort of see for yourself and you can also use it to come up with your own flavor combinations. Just go to flavorpairing.com and you can make a free account. Then click create or create a new pairing and this is where the fun really starts. So add any ingredients you're interested in. I'll just pick ginger, I love ginger. And okay, it plots it on your network here. Then go on and add a second ingredient. And it actually gives you some suggestions here. So like the best match is represented by this blue circle. A good match has this tinier blue circle and just like a regular match is a white circle. So it's, it's trying to help you. Oh, gin, I like gin. Ooh, this in general looks like a very good cocktail here. So let's click on gin and it puts it on the network. So you have to go on, add the rest of your ingredients, so on and so on, and just build up your recipe to, you know, see what flavor combinations might be good that are unexpected. Well, the food pairing principle has a lot of like merit and accolades, and most chefs like know about it, and it's, it's given us these really wonderful new and unique flavor pairings it definitely has some drawbacks or weaknesses. The first being that not all ingredients are added for their flavor potential. So for example, we might use something like paprika simply for its coloring ability to color the food. Another great example is eggs, which we often use as like a very functional ingredient to either make a gel or maybe help make a foam. We're not adding it because eggs have this really great aroma. But perhaps the biggest shortcoming of the food pairing hypothesis is that it doesn't work for every culture. So studies have seen that for North American cultures and Northern Europe, these cuisines, we do tend to pair flavors that are very similar, that foods that have a lot of overlap in flavors. So we do follow this food pairing hypothesis. But other cultures like East Asian cultures specifically, they actually tend to do the exact opposite. East Asian cultures do not like ingredients that have a lot of flavor overlap and don't tend to make these combinations. If you enjoyed this video, next I would check out my video where I explain the science behind color changing foods.